About a decade ago, there was a study that was uh, conducted by the Barna Group. The Barna Group was, uh, or is, uh, an evangelical research organization, and they did a study and they confirmed something that we already knew, which was young people uh, from 16 to 29 are more resistant to and skeptical of the church than they were a decade ago or two decades ago or whatever. There are a lot of those kinds of studies that are out and about. And um, one of the perceptions of this particular study that they found was that kind of up at the top, like 90% of young people in this age range uh, tended to view Christians as judgmental. Right? So if you've heard this before, it's not new necessarily. And maybe you've found this to be the case for yourself. If you've grown up in the Bible Belt, that you've come across Christians who are uh, kind of consumed by a judgmental attitude of others. I, I, sometimes I think it doesn't come from a bad place necessarily. There's a way that the, things should go. There's a way that things should be. And if you're not living up to that, like there's, you know, there are some issues there. But the way it kind of comes across um, oftentimes is kind of negative. It's as if, um, it's as if these, these folks are self-appointed critics who can just like lay out in this kind of superior self-righteous fashion uh, the way it should be in such a way that it comes across as just, I mean, honestly, just frankly mean more than anything else. Um, I also know that there's some Christians that kind of go in the other direction, right? So uh, they've read the scripture, maybe you've read the scripture, and you, you've heard, don't judge uh, so that you may not be judged. So something that Jesus says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. So if you take that to heart, maybe that means that we're not supposed to judge. Maybe never are we supposed to judge, and we're just supposed to be nice at all costs, all the time. And the problem with that is if you just, there's no judgment at all, and it, we're only supposed to be nice, is that when there are things that are harmful to the community or behaviors that are hurtful, um, that if we're only supposed to be nice and never to judge, that you know, we just let some things go that maybe we shouldn't let go. What I am coming to understand as I, I get older and as I become a parent and um, as I, you know, enter into adult life is what you probably have come to realize as well, which is we cannot avoid making judgments. Judgment is a part of a mature uh, life. If you're a teenager, you're giving more responsibility, and with more responsibility comes uh, the uh, expectation that you would exercise better judgment, right? What is judgment other than it's the capacity to, uh, to make considered decisions, to, make, to come to sensible conclusions, and the more responsibility you get, the more you have to learn how to make good, good judgments, not only for yourself, but of others. I, this, I, I've been thinking about this in terms of parenting. I was not given a manual. My mom's here today, but she did not give me the manual of how to make good decisions and judgments as it relates to parenting my children. I wish she had. Or if you're a leader of an organization, or if you're a teacher in a classroom, or in, in whatever realm of life you're in, I'm, I'm sure that you're, you're faced with all of these ways in which you need to learn to make good judgments um, in the Bible, uh, the Bible knows about this as well. It doesn't ask us to be judgmental or not to judge completely, but there's this sense in the Bible that uh, we have to learn how to make uh, good judgments. And, and what good judgments mean are judgments that, uh, of ourselves and one another that are not destructive, but constructive. That, that don't tear down, but that build up. The series that we're looking at right now is called Life Together. We're looking at 1 Corinthians, which is the first letter that the Apostle Paul, who was a leader in the early church, wrote to a church that he founded in Corinth. And last week we began the series. If you weren't here, you can go back and find those online uh, on our, our website or our social media accounts. Um, and you can kind of catch up on where we've been. But basically the idea is that Paul founded the community, was there for about 18 months, and then he moved on. And when he moved on, he uh, was still in correspondence with folks in Corinth, and he's come across the fact that there are problems in the community, in the church that he founded. And at the heart of the problems is this commitment, this, these kind of allegiances that are being offered and quarrels and divisions in the church. Some people are saying, I belong to Paul. I, others are saying, I belong to Apollo. Some people say, I belong to Cephas. Three 
early church leaders. They are dividing themselves based on uh, their allegiances to charismatic leaders in the church. Some people are saying, I just rise above the fray and I just follow Christ, you know. You know, that never happens anymore either, right? So anyway, so this is the division that's going on, and Paul wants to point their attention to, uh, to what unites them, their common purpose and identity that's rooted in the cross of Christ. That the cross of Christ is wiser than human wisdom, even though it looks foolish. It's the power of God, and it's the center of the church's life and identity. And he wants them to build their life together on the foundation of Christ. As the letter progresses, you see that one of the issues that the Corinthians are struggling with is the issue of judgment, how to make good judgments about one another. They're quarreling, after all. And so Paul thinks it's not just their judgments of one another, but their judgments of him as a leader. And one of the things he's trying to do in the early parts of the letter is to reassert his authority as a teacher and leader, as the father and founder of the church. And how you read this part of the letter really depends on what you think about Paul. You know, if you think Paul is a super judgmental guy, you're probably not going to like this part of the letter. Let me just say, you know, uh, if you want to read the letter charitably and actually get something from it, you know, try for a moment to kind of withhold your judgment of Paul, right? And, and to think about Paul as a church planner. If, if you had founded a community, if you had founded a church and you had left and then you came back in, and they were just doing things all in the ways that they shouldn't do them, all in the ways that you knew that if they continued in this way that the whole thing was going to fall apart. Uh, think of it in that way, as if you were the leader, and you left, and every, you know, everything was breaking, breaking apart. Okay? So this is, uh, in chapter 4, is what we're looking at today, at this moment where Paul is trying to reassert his authority and push back on some of the criticism. And this is what Paul says, verse 1. Think of us, that is, all of the teachers, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, all the teachers in the church, think of us in this way, as servants of Christ, as stewards of the very mysteries of God. Now, uh, this image of being a servant, you know, uh, of being a slave for Christ is one that Paul employs a lot. And it's rooted in this image of, um, you, ha you have to think about uh, like um, the kind of servant or slave in the ancient world who would be given delegated authority to run the household. So we don't, by analogy, you can think of somebody you, almost like the foreman on a job site. So not the contractor, but the foreman who comes out and runs the job actually who has this delegated authority, and then he meets it out to get all the contracts completed. Um, or you could think about it like the chief of staff at the White House. He's someone who doesn't have ultimate authority. Ultimate authority is Christ's authority. Christ is Lord and master, and Paul is a slave or servant or steward of the master's authority for the life of the church. And so for him, the first step is to say, uh, that what is required for stewards and servants is that they're trustworthy. And we know this to be the case as well. Who do you listen to? Who do you allow? Who do you give permission to to speak into your life? To actually at tell you when something is wrong? It, it, if you don't respect that person, if you don't trust that it's within the context of a loving relationship where you have trust with that person, you're going to dismiss it, you're going to see it as coercive or whatever. But Paul says it, it's important to think of us in this way. We're stewards and servants, and what's required is to be trustworthy. And I think that's the case. Good judgment only occurs within the context of loving and trustworthy relationships. So if somebody's kind of coming at you or scrutinizing you or examining you in a way that seems harsh, and it's not within the context of a loving and trustworthy relationship, you might, it might give you pause. But on the other hand, if it's somebody that you know is out for your good, who desires for you to flourish, who, who believes in you wholeheartedly, that you can do the job, that you can do the thing, that you have it within you to do the thing, then you can listen and not be defensive, right? Because that person's out for your good. They don't desire bad things for you. If they are offering judgments or critiques or examination, it's within the context of the desire to see you become the kind of person that God desires for you to be, to live into the kind of community that you can be if only you would kind of offer yourself to it. So that's the frame that Paul begins to say uh, it's, it's important that we're trustworthy and that's going to be for you to judge. But then he moves on and kind of pushes back against their criticism. 
But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. I think that by any human court is important. Because just think about the ways in which we often live, right? The ways we make decisions, the ways in which we live in the world. It's often, often we are just completely debilitated by the expectations and the judgments of other people. I know that it's the case for me that oftentimes I get so caught up in what people think about me, about the human courts of opinion, right? That I don't know what to do. And if that's you today, you should remember that the judgment of other people Paul says is not final. It's not the end all be all. Other people's judgment, other people's opinion, that's not the end of all things. Um, It's not final. Um, And this is helpful because it can kind of, you know, it can kind of liberate you from unreasonable scrutiny or examination. On the other hand, Paul, if you go back to that last slide, Ben, if you don't mind. Um, But he also says, I don't even judge myself which I think is interesting, because often I find, at least today, that, that um, a lot of people that I know, they're so harsh on, them, on themselves. The harshest critic and judge is actually themselves. And Paul says, I don't even judge myself, which suggests to me that maybe we're not in the position to be, we're not in the best position to be the judge of our own lives. Isn't that an interesting thought? If you scrutinize and examine yourself to the point where you can't even hardly do anything, perhaps you could feel the liberation of the reality that you're not in the position to judge your own life, that, that you're, you shouldn't be the judge of your own life. But rather what Paul says in verse 4 is, is this, I'm not aware of anything against myself. He's saying, I'm not the judge of my life. I don't know of anything against myself, but I, I'm not, that doesn't mean that I'm off the hook or acquitted. The Lord is the judge of me. The Lord, the Lord is the judge of me. There's no one else, ultimately, who is in a position to judge your life other than the Lord. And this is liberating on one level, and on the other level, it's actually like uh, revealing, because your life is there before the one who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. It is the Lord who judges me and no one else. It is the Lord who is the judge of any human life. Okay, so if that's true, then why is Paul so judgy, right? If you read the letter, what is the letter but Paul's judgment of the Corinthians? If if God is the judge, then how is Paul why is Paul spending so much time judging these guys? And in order to understand that, I think you have to kind of back backtrack a little bit to the the previous chapter. So I'm gonna take a step back before we go forward. Step back. Um, so he's again, he's in this, he's trying to Um, help them to understand the relationship between his teaching and authority and Apollos, uh, you know, presumably a teacher that's come after him. And this is what he says. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Well, we're the same. We're servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So we were working, we're on the same team here. We're the same kind of people God assigned to us different tasks. I planted, Apollos watered, but neither of us are as important as the Lord of the harvest who gives the growth, right? So then he goes on. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters, they have common purpose with one another. And what is their purpose? They're God's servants, verse 9. We are God's servants, that's Apollos, Paul, Cephas, and we're working together. Don't try to divide us or divide yourselves among Uh, me, you know, this faction over here and that faction over here, the 845, you know, the 845 church are kind of these kind of people, and the 9 o'clock, you know, they're, they're, they're their own animal, and then the 1055 folks, right, you know, like, don't do that, we're on, we're on the same team, it's a common purpose, right, we have a common purpose together, Um, and you are God's field, Paul says, you are, uh, so he, then he shifts from agricultural metaphor to construction metaphor, which he does all the time. You are God's building. And I love this next part. According to the grace given to me, like a skilled master builder. So now Paul is putting on his, his uh, contractor hat or his foreman's hat. And he says, like a skilled and master builder, I laid the foundation. Somebody else is building upon it. I had to go start a church in another place. Somebody else is building upon it. Each builder must choose with care how to build upon the foundation. 
But you don't get to choose the foundation if you're the church. The foundation has already been set. In verse 11, he says this. He says, no one can lay a foundation other than the one that's been laid. And the foundation is Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of that church, the church in Corinth. It's the foundation of this church. The foundation is Christ. Anything, anybody who comes in and says, we got a different foundation is off base. The foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. Nothing less and nothing more. Verse 12 and 13. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold or silver or precious stone or wood or hay or straw, the work of each builder will become visible. And you just think about this. Have you ever done a home remodel or you've built a house or you've been a part of a, an organization that, that started a new building or whatever? This is the way it is, right? You lay the foundation and then you, 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 uh, you build the structure and on the structure you're going to have various kinds of things that are built. And then it's, it, become, it comes the day for the inspector to come, right? The inspector has to come uh, to, to judge the work of the electrician or the plumber or whatever before the sheetrock goes up. Because if you put the sheetrock up before the inspector comes and then there's a leak, what happens? You're going to have a big problem on your hand. So you invite the judgment of the inspector before the job is over so that at the, at the last day, at the final day when all things are disclosed, you know, it's like the far fire marshal. You want the fire marshal to come before the, the fire comes to make sure that everything, you know, you've got the fire retardant wall in the right place or whatever. Because there will come a day when, when what has been built will be tested. And it's important that the, the builders in the process show their work and that, because it's going to become visible either now or later. It's almost like you have a friend down at the permit office, right? You're the children of God. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, worry about the judgment uh, because you've got a friend down at the inspector's office who's coming in and you should welcome the inspection now because, uh, so that you don't have to, to fear it later, Paul seems to say. And this, build, this construction metaphor is, is given over. He's saying, I laid the foundation, and the foundation is Jesus Christ. Anything built on the foundation, if it's straw or hay, it's going to burn away. But if it's solid, it, it, it will remain. And, it, and he's worried about the ways in which the foundation of the cross of Christ is being built upon by pretension and arrogance and superiority and self-righteousness and all the terrible things that human beings do when human beings construct human community. And he's saying, in the end, all of that stuff will be burned away because it's not of Christ. And what will remain, what will shine forth with golden splendor will be that which is in keeping with the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Later, next week, we're going to be looking at part of his criticism of them. And within that, a famous phrase that you know of, it kind of helps to frame what he's trying to do here. It's this, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, right? If you are judging others out of a position of, I'm right, and I'm super smart, and I know the way it should be, and that comes across to somebody like arrogance and superiority and self-righteousness, then that's not of Christ. But if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to offer judgment out of the context of love in such a way that it's not destructive, but constructive, that it builds the other person up, that it builds up the body of Christ, then you're in keeping with what he thinks is the, the, the intentions of God, etc. So the question, I think, for the Christian community is this. How can we practice judgment in ways that build up rather than tear down? We don't need to be judgmental. And we don't need to just be nice all the time. We've got to practice good judgment. We've got to learn how to do that together. How do we do that in such a way that we build up rather than tear down? How can we learn to make good judgments that build up one another and that build up the body of Christ? Now, there are a lot of things that we could say, right? There are a lot of different dimensions of making good judgments. And Paul just highlights and underlines one of them. And that is that Oftentimes, we're too quick to judge. We rush in, and we don't have all the facts, and we're too quick to judge. So he underlines this in verse 5. Therefore, don't pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive commendation, that is praise, 
from God. Don't pronounce judgment before the time. Don't pronounce judgment too soon. That's the problem. We're too quick to judge. It's at least one of the problems. And one of the things that we could work on would simply be to slow down and not to rush in, not to demonize too quickly, but to slow our roll. <laughs> right? Hold on a minute and don't pronounce judgment too soon. So uh, it wasn't, it was last year, last November, when I, I, I heard about this episode on Saturday Night Live's Weekend Update. I used to watch Saturday Night Live, but I don't watch it anymore. I have young children, so I can't stay up that late anymore, right? So I just follow up the next week on whatever's going on. And so Weekend Update is this segment uh, that's, that's really funny. A lot of people have done it. Pete Davidson, who's this young comic who uh, has a, a history of just inopportune, like putting his foot in his mouth, this is Pete Davidson. And he did this terrible, uh, inopportune joke um, and this is what was going on. He was, it was right at the midterm elections last year, and in the midst of a, a, a series of quick punch punch lines mocking the appearance of various congressional candidates, he then threw this picture up of Lieutenant Commander Dan Crenshaw, who was a Republican from Texas running. Uh, and, um, and so Davidson kind of rushes in, and he said, this guy's cool, and then he made a really terrible joke that I can't say in church. And then he added... I'm sorry, uh, I know this guy lost an eye in war or whatever, and it was a terrible, it was a terrible line, right? It was a terrible line, it was insult comedy, and insult comedy, I mean, let's just be honest, it's not the noblest subgenre of, of, of comedy, um, and in order for it to really work, the audience has to agree that the person being, uh, you know, kind of flayed open needs to be knocked down a peg or two, that's the only way it can work. And it's pretty clear that a, a liberal comedian doesn't have the ground to stand on to undercut and malign a war hero, right? So what happened with, with uh, Lieutenant Commander's eye is that he lost his eye in Afghanistan uh, in an IED explosion. And everybody erupted. Everybody rushed in with swift judgment and criticism, probably rightly so. Um, but I think it was, it was interesting and surprising that, um, that Crenshaw didn't do that. Exactly. He didn't rush in and, and jump in and pile on and uh, offer judgment too soon. He, he didn't call for an immediate apology, he didn't say Pete Davidson should be fired. Instead, what he did uh, was he waited for a minute, took a deep breath. Um, in uh, classic Saturday Night Live fashion, they resolved the situation by bringing Pete Davidson, uh, or bringing Dan Crenshaw on to Weekend Update the next Saturday, and giving Pete an opportunity to apologize on behalf of the show and himself, um, and uh, they allowed Dan Crenshaw to really kind of make fun of Pete Davidson. He, uh, he thanked him for making a Republican look really good, right? And he, uh, he, he made some jokes, and then after the jokes, he said, he said this, um, so Crenshaw, uh, Davidson said this, he said, I'm sure uh, uh, that it was a shock for the people who know me that I made a poor choice last week. This man is a war hero and he deserves all the respect in the world. And Crenshaw thanked him. And then he added, uh, Americans can forgive one another. We can remember what brings us together as a country and see the good in each other. It was Veterans Day weekend and that was a part of the thing. Uh, so there was this apology. And then Crenshaw referenced Davidson's father who died uh, he was a firefighter. Davidson's father was a firefighter in 9-11 when Davidson was seven years old. Um, and uh, uh, Crenshaw, you know, honored him as one of the heroes uh, that had died uh, as a part of Veterans Day. Crenshaw said, never forget. Davidson said, never forget. And I just think it's an interesting story because while we're quick to judge, in this moment, Crenshaw really didn't do that. He paused and hesitated long enough for there to be something new that emerged, so this moment of apology and forgiveness, something different. And it wasn't everything, it doesn't change the national civil discourse or whatever, right? But it was this moment where he wasn't quick to pronounce judgment. And I think that's something that the church could learn to do better. So our question is, as we live our life together, what does it look like for us to practice judgment in such a way that we build others up rather than tear them down? Until... Uh, there, there will come a day, right? There will come a day when the chief building inspector comes and we're asked to show our work. And everything within us 
uh, will be laid forth before the judgment of God. And everything that's arrogant and pretentious and self-righteous, all that stuff will be burned away. And the only thing that will remain is what is of Christ, right? And until that day, until that day, we have to learn as the church to live in such a way that we learn as the body of Christ to make thousands of small judgments with and for one another without demonizing one another, without tearing each other down, without assuming the worst of the people that are the, on the other side of any conflict. And, and then, if we do that, with Christ as our sure foundation, we, we can trust that what is built in us and through us and for us, what we build together will be of such beauty and goodness and truth that not only will our children and our children's children desire to be drawn to the cross of Christ, but our God will be glorified, and we can give thanks. Amen. Let's pray. God, you alone are the judge. You alone are in a position to help us to to see and know ourselves more deeply. We desire not to build upon your foundation anything that is of us, We ask that you purify and consume our every thought and desire and affection so that our life together would look more like you, our Lord. See us and know us, O Lord. Amen.